Good morning. Hey, thanks for taking time to be able to join us today. My name is Pastor Jeremy DePina, if I've not had the privilege of being able to meet you yet. And uh, today, as Pastor Mark mentioned, is both our confirmation celebration and, of course, a celebration of being able to uh, get to the end of the story, chapter 31, uh, a unique section of scripture because it's entitled The End of Time. And I know when you hear that, it might sound a little uh, scary, it might sound a little weird, but there is so much more that is yet to come in this offering through this book. Let's look at that just briefly this morning. You know, uh, my friend has this fish tank in his office. It's a saltwater fish tank, and it's really beautiful. Uh, He's got all different types of fish in there, and for the most part, uh, I think they have it really good. You know, he feeds them. Every day, there's no predators in there to be able to go after them. The water is clean. They really don't have to do anything. They have it, they have it really pretty easy. So just make believe with me real quick this morning. What would it be like if you took an actual saltwater fish from the ocean that knows of all the different things that are out there in that great, grand, big world and placed it in this tank with these other fish? A fish that could tell them about what the world really looked like and how there was so much more out there. Do you think those fish in their safe little place in their aquarium would want to be able to go out and do more? Would they want to be able to go out and explore? Or would they want to stay in their nice, comfortable, safe little aquarium? You know, there's a lot more out there in life for us. But for you and I, especially as Christians, we probably have it pretty easy today in our own little aquarium, in our own little area. And today as we explore the book of Revelation, it shares with us that there's so much more out there in the world for us to be able to see. And it's not just the end of time, but it's the beginning of something grand and new and big. In the time that we have today, uh, we really don't have uh, appropriate uh, time just to be able to go through everything that's in the book of Revelation. So work with it just briefly with me today as we kind of look at the beginning and look at the ending and hope it kind of fills in the gap for us a little bit. Maybe just a little bit of history on the book of Revelation. It was written by John. Uh, that's mentioned four times by the author in this book. Uh, it was written about the year 95 AD. And throughout this book, uh, it's filled with all different types of symbolism. And that's why I think the book of Revelation gets so much attention of people wanting to know both about what is the end of time going to be like and what are all these things going to mean for me in Scripture. It almost has this mysterious element. And it's hard for John to be able to describe this vision that he gets from God because it's something that hasn't even happened yet. Have you ever had a, a dream and you know the elements that are there that you've seen and you try to describe it to somebody and it's hard just to put in words? I think John... Uh, It struggles with that a little bit for us today. But let's see, just to start off, uh, what that symbolism kind of looks like in the book of Revelation. Look at this verse with me today. It's from Revelation chapter 21, the first verse. And John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. You know, when I read this passage, the first part sounds super exciting. This concept that God is going to build for you and I, this new heaven and this new earth. But when you get to that last section there, when John says there is no longer any sea, I must admit that's something that kind of makes me a little sad. You know, growing up in, in California, we always loved to go to the beach. Many of you probably like to go and vacation at beaches all over the United States or maybe all over the world to be able to put your feet in the sand, to be able to hear that sound of the waves at nighttime to be able to watch the sun as it sets over that sea, all those beautiful elements. And then John says, yeah, but in heaven, none of those things are going to exist. Why would God take something so pretty and something so meaningful that all of us enjoy and just take it out of heaven? You've got to recognize in the book of Revelation, everything that we read is not necessarily literal. Now, we've got to be careful with being able to change things around or try to add things in. Our reading said make sure we're not doing that today. But just take this for an example. John, when he writes this letter, this book of Revelation to the churches, is confined on this little island called Patmos. The government has sent him to be exiled 
basically to be imprisoned there, and he isn't around any of his family members, he isn't around any of his friends, and he isn't around his church family, and this really hurts his heart. And I can only imagine sitting on this island that he probably yearns to be able to be with his friends, with his family, with his church, that are all the way on the other side of this big sea. But he tells them, when God comes back for you and I, the sea is no longer going to exist. And he's talking about the separation that's there. Not necessarily that there won't be an ocean in heaven. Maybe God will make an ocean for us in heaven or different bodies of water. But that the separation won't exist. The separation that maybe you and I have at times, if we disagree, the separation that maybe you and I have when somebody dies and somebody is still here on earth living, or the separation that we have with, with God. And so remember when we go through the book of Revelation, all those different elements that are there. And the Christians, not only John, are really up against it right now in the book of Revelation. Uh, they're going through all different battles with the government and with the authorities that are around them that are trying to persecute them in all different ways. They want them only to worship the emperor at this time, and if they don't, uh, they're persecuting them, they're throwing them in jail, they're beating them, they're killing many of them. Think about those Colosseum times that happens during uh, this realm. And during this point, you would think that Christianity would really take a blow, but actually it begins to thrive more and more and more. And we see that in a lot of ways over history, not just here at this time with John, but with the church as a whole, as it continues to thrive a lot of times under persecution. You know, today, you and I probably aren't under a lot of different persecutions. Don't get me wrong, there's things that we face, uh, things that we see that are against Christianity in a lot of different ways. However, you and I, in our little aquarium, probably have it pretty easy and pretty good most of the time, especially compared to what these Christians had to face. But this doesn't mean that the devil won't come after you. In fact, I think he still comes after all of us in many different ways. In fact, I, I know he does. I think he just used different tools to be able to go after you. What do you think the tool is? Just think to yourself with me this morning that the devil used to be able to go after you today. What does it look like? I don't know if you've ever lost, watched uh, ASU basketball before, the Sun Devils. So the Sun Devils, uh, during the second half of the game, set up this little curtain on the opposing side's court. And during this time, they, they set this up so when somebody is up there trying to make a, a free throw, they are, are going to try to distract them. And in fact, that's what they call this. They call this the devil's curtain of distraction. So this curtain is up there. Imagine that you're in front of all these people. You have all these pressures already. You need to make this shot to be able to win, to be able to put your team ahead, to be able to catch up. And all of a sudden, this curtain appears. And right before you are about to be able to take your shot that you are so focused on, the curtain opens. And behind this curtain can be anything. This is a picture from one of the games. There can be anything behind there. And this has actually been so uh, proven to be so happy or, or such a good tool for the devils that they actually have won a lot of their games just by one or two points by being able to have this curtain and distract somebody from being able to focus on their goal. Today, I want to look at just a couple of questions with you again for us just to think about. You don't have to answer these with anybody that's here today, just with yourself. Look at this first one with me today. Have you become distracted from a future in Christ? You know, all of us are here today, we're here to worship, we're here to be able to support our confirmands, but are you distracted from a future in Christ, that which is yet to come? In our aquarium, we got it pretty good, guys. It's pretty, pretty simple, it's pretty easy, but there is so much more, so much more that God has called us to, both in this life and in the life that is yet to come. Remember that and focus on that, that the things that we do here today are these, these eternal elements that we are able to share with others. The, the time that we share, the message that we share, the gifts that we give, all things that God has given to us to be able to give to others. You see, it isn't just in this life or just on a Sunday or just on whenever we pick it that we are supposed to be able to honor and worship God. It's all the time in our life. In fact, Paul tells the church at Corinth these words. He says, if only in this life we have hope in Christ, we of all people are most 
to be pitied. If it's only in this life, we are the most ones to be pitied. When I read this verse uh, this week, there's only one thing that I could think about. Hey, boys, do you know who this guy is? <laughs> do you have any idea, any of you? Do you have no idea? <laughs> anybody, anybody else have any idea who this is? Who is this? Yeah, it's Mr. T. Jeez, where have you guys been? This guy had his own dolls, like his own cereal even. Mr. T, you can't even tell if he's wearing a shirt. He's got so much gold on him all the time. But Mr. T used to also have a slogan or a phrase. I shouldn't even say used to. He still uses it today. Does anybody remember the, the slogan that Mr. T always said? Greg, what is it? Oh, yeah, everybody's got it. I pity the fool. Yeah, you guys are great. I pity the fool is what he always said. So I saw an article with Mr. T, and they specifically asked him, how did you come up with that? How did you come up with this concept? I pity the fool. What does that even mean? And he actually said, completely honestly, he said, I took this from the Bible. And they said, what do you mean? Tell us about that. And he said, there's so many people in the Bible that do foolish things that then have to have God's pity placed upon them. And I thought about this verse for today, because I don't want God to say that and look down upon us that I pity the fool, a foolish move that we have made of not being able to know of the life that we have that is yet to come. Remember that verse. If only in this life we have Christ, we are most of all the one who is to be pitied. God wants us to be able to know, again, that there is so much more than what we have today, that God has offered us so much more to be able to celebrate and to be able to lift up and to be able to live and so I ask you just another question, just to kind of ponder with me today and just to think about. Because remember, we're supposed to be able to hear these messages, and me too, I'm right there with you, to be able to evaluate our walk and where we're at. So here's our question. As the church, are we living for Christ today? Are you living for Christ today? Or is your life filled with distractions? If your life is filled with distractions, what do those look like? What are you caught up in? Do you only come to church here with me on Sunday and then the rest of the week is no big deal of living for Christ today? Do you only live for Christ when you're in front of your spouse or your children or your church friends and then the, the rest of the week it's not anything to do with Christ? Are we living for him today in everything that we do? I know there's a lot of distractions in our life and it can be difficult for us at times to be able to stand up for our Savior. But when we remember that he stood up for us, it should change the way that we view everything. And this hasn't been a problem for our church just in the past 10 years or 20 years, but it's been a problem for centuries. In fact, in the very beginning of the book of Revelation, when John is writing to all those churches that he's separated from, he's telling them different things and addressing all different issues that they are struggling with in their life. And one of the churches he writes to is this church in Laodicea. And when he writes to them, they're struggling with, with a problem that's probably very common in our society today. Look at this verse with me from Revelation uh, chapter 3. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. And these aren't the words that John is just saying. These are the words, if you look in your Bible, it's all red letter because Jesus is saying these words to this church. How many people here like coffee? Yeah. Uh, I like hot coffee. I like cold coffee. They're great. You know what I don't like? Lukewarm coffee, right? It's, it's horrible. It doesn't taste good. Why? Because it wasn't made to be like that. It's the same thing for, think about like a, Food like chicken or something, right? You can have chicken cold on a salad. It tastes great in a Chinese chicken salad. You can have hot chicken right off the grill, some type of barbecued chicken or fried chicken that you make, and it tastes great hot. Chicken that's lukewarm does not taste good. And in fact, it can make us super sick, can't it? That's where it's getting to in this verse. Uh, when Jesus actually says, I want you to be cold or I want you to be hot, that word spit there that I actually spit you out of my mouth, uh, the grotesque translation, actually, in the original language is actually vomit, that you make me sick because you're not one or the other. It is such a temptation for us as Christians not to live in the world as hot as the ones that God has created us to be. 
to be able to have a foot in the world and out of the world and back and forth in a lot of different ways and to be able to live lukewarm. But again, that's not who Jesus calls us to be able to be. There are things you probably don't want to do to be able to serve people around you, but God calls you to be able to do them. There are things you probably don't want to give or give up for people around you, or maybe even for Jesus, but God calls us to be able to give those things up. There are distractions that are going to be hard for us to be able to get rid of, or comfortable places that will be tough for us to be able to leave. But God calls us as a church not to be lukewarm, but to be all in. Because he was a God that was all in for us in everything that he did. This is that revelation that God gives to the churches today. And it's a revelation that we should ponder in our final question for today. What are we to do with this revelation of Jesus? We celebrated Easter just a handful of weeks ago. And we know the truth. Jesus came, he died, he rose again so that you can be forgiven and so that you can live an eternal life. What do we do with those words? Because God comes to each and every one of us today and he wants to know. In fact, he has something to be able to give to us. That's how the book of Revelation uh, uh, offers our Savior. He says, here I am. These are the words of Jesus. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Think about that invitation from God. For our confirmands here today, think about that invitation that Jesus gives to each and every one of you as you get to have your first communion with him today. And I've told you before, I can't explain it. Nobody else in this room can explain it to you either of how God is able to have his body and his blood present there in those elements. But it's there because he tells us it's there. And he wants to be able to commune with you. And as part, Pastor Mark mentioned, that's the, the invitation that all of us get today. An invitation from our Lord to be able to come and to be able to commune with him and to be able to always be united with him. Because God gives us a great invitation to attend truly a wonderful party that he has put aside and set up especially for you. And that's how the book of Revelation concludes, is with that invitation. Not something that is just the end, but something that is the beginning. Look at what that party looks like today. John says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God is in his dwelling place now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Think about that invitation. That God will dwell with you. That's today, and that's eventually permanently in a perfect way in the future. So all of you that are out there today that are struggling with different things, that are asking that question, when is this going to happen? When is God going to come and perfectly dwell with me? When is God going to take away that physical pain that my father is struggling with? When is God going to take away that relationship brokenness that I have in my heart from that divorce I went through? When is God going to take away that pain from that death that I just had to face of one of my closest family members ever? And all of us ask that question, and Jesus today gives us an answer as he wraps up with our final scripture. John says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. This is a promise that Jesus makes to you directly today. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're going through, yes, I am going to come soon. Throughout this whole section of readings in the Story Bible, there wasn't one chapter that God ever made a promise that he didn't fulfill. And I promise in chapter 31, he won't start with not fulfilling his promises either. And so today, from his lips Unto your ears and your hearts, remember that promise. Yes, I am coming soon. And to we, his people, then all respond together. Say these last four words with me. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.